Easter's coming up on April 1st. Uh, many of you filled out a prayer card uh, for some people that you're praying will be here on Easter Sunday. And now that we've prayed for them for a couple of weeks, now it's time to put some feet to those prayers and go and invite them to church for Easter Sunday. We've got brunch 
um, at 9.30 a.m. on Easter Sunday. And so that's a free brunch for everybody. If you can bring something for that, uh, would you just go see Connie Gilworth when we're done here today? Let her know uh, that so we can make sure that we've got that well planned out. And uh, we're excited about it. We've got 10.45 a.m. service, same time for the service. Um, obviously no Sunday school that day. Um, and we are going to have a children's musical. Uh, and also our teens are going to be involved in that in a shadow theater. So uh, I think it's going to be uh, an exciting experience. You won't want to miss it. And especially if you've got a young person involved, we want to see you here that day. Uh, they're going to do a great job. Appreciate those that are working with them and helping them uh, get that done. We've got a church work day coming up next Saturday to help us get ready for Easter Sunday. You probably noticed when you walked in, uh, the columns look a little different this week. Uh, we tore the old columns off. They were falling off and just wasn't quite uh, up to muster. So we took those off. And now we're going to put some uh, new things on there next week, some new column wraps on there next Saturday, and we'd love to have your help with that. We've got other projects as well. We're going to be painting the gym. We're hanging some handrails in the stairwell. Lots of little things as well. Lots of little projects we're trying to knock out before Easter and so that we can just have a great day and not have to, to notice those things or think about those things on Easter Sunday. April 8th, the week after Easter, um, Carolyn Hauser, uh, we're going to have a baby shower for her. Uh, she is expecting in the month of April, and uh, she and Robert, this will be their third child, and their first child with uh, as members of Midway and so we're excited about that and the opportunity to shower some love on them so we're gonna have a baby shower during the Sunday lunch on April 8th okay so uh, she's registered at Walmart and Amazon.com and if you can't get to Walmart and don't know how to use Amazon diapers and wipes go a long way uh, so you know just uh, let's, let's shower them with love that day and stick around and join us for that baby shower on the 8th and then of course we've got spring awakening coming up uh, be inviting folks out for that letting them know um, about that special day. Any birthdays to celebrate this week? Any birthdays? Quincy, when's your birthday? The 22nd. Is this, how old are you going to be this? Nine. That's a, I can't believe that. Nine years old. Well, you have a happy birthday. Anybody else? All right. How about anniversaries? Got any anniversaries to celebrate? That's right. Yeah, we, we put Mike on the spot about that last week. But, yep, congratulations. Happy anniversary to you guys. And uh, I don't know what he got off the resource center. If he didn't get anything good, you go get it. You get, go get your own anniversary present. But uh, <laughs> happy anniversary to you guys. Appreciate you. Anybody else? All right. Well, you guys make sure to stop by the resource center. Quincy, there's some good stuff back there for young guys. Uh, and you enjoy a, a gift on behalf of the church there. All right, we're going to get back into our song service at this time. Hymn 157, if you want to follow along with the sheet music, the songs will be up on the screen. If you would stand with us as we sing the grace greater than our sin. Hymn 157.
few weeks ago, our ensemble introduced a song to you called Before the Throne of God Above. And uh, many of you, I think, knew it as we were singing it. It looked like you were humming along and following along. If you know it, sing it with us. And those of you that don't, you're going to get an opportunity to learn it today. The, the, the words of this song are powerful. They're transformative, really, if you'll listen to them and think about what Jesus Christ did for us. Sing it with us. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart, I know that Stands. No tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with Himself I cannot die. My soul is purchased by His blood. My life is hid with Christ on high. With Christ my Savior and my God. With Christ my Savior and my God. One with himself I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high. With Christ my Savior and my God. With Christ my Savior and my God. Saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see.
seated there. And we're going to uh, take a moment to give our tithes and offerings to the Lord this morning. If I could have some gentlemen help me with this, uh, grab a plate there. We'll uh, pray together and ask God's blessings on these funds. And uh, we're so thankful for the opportunity to worship God through the offering plate. And uh, thank you for your faithfulness and giving to the Lord. Uh, may God bless you for it. But let's pray together and uh, we'll give here this morning. Brother Jimmy, would you lead, it, lead us?
We're going to dismiss our kids for Children's Church at this time. And as they're dismissed, why don't you stand there and shake somebody's hand and tell them you're glad to see them here this morning. Take a minute just to fellowship and uh, say hello to everyone. Then we'll get into the message. as we find our way back to our seats there uh, we're going to turn together to John chapter 15 if you would turn there with me John chapter 15 and verse number 8 John chapter 15 let's read this together John chapter 15 and verse number 5 is where we're going to pick up I apologize John chapter 15 verse 5 as we read this together the Bible says I am the vine ye are the branches He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples." Let's pray together and we'll ask God to help us as we study this. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the songs uh, this morning. Thank you for the the congregation uh, as they sang. And Lord, I trust that they worshiped you this morning, that they gave themselves to you. And Lord, we want to honor you today uh, through the offering plate, through our song service. But Lord, now as we turn to the preaching time, I pray that you would be lifted up and magnified. I pray that you would be pleased with all that is said. And I pray that the word of God would have its way with us. Lord, we trust that this is your message to us, that this is your word for our lives today. And Lord, we need you to speak to us now. So I pray that you'd use me as your messenger. Lord, fill me with your spirit. And may Jesus Christ be honored and magnified today. And as we think about this idea of the vine and branches, may there be someone today who makes a decision that they're not just going to be a, uh, a believer but they're going to be a committed follower of Jesus Christ. Not just a spectator, but a disciple of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you'd speak to all of us in that area. Lord, convict all of us where we need to be convicted. Encourage us where we need to be encouraged. And Lord, if there's someone here today that doesn't know what's going to happen to them when they leave this world, I pray that you'd speak to their heart and show them their need for Jesus Christ today. And we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. As we've been going through this series on the vine and the branches, we've been talking about several different uh, topics, several different ideas, and we've been going through these three categories. And we started with the idea of abiding in Christ, what it means to abide in Him and have Him abide in us. Now this week we turn to our second category, our second key word that we're following, and it's the word abound. Abound, not just to abide, but as the branches, as the followers of Jesus Christ, we are not just to abide, but we are to abound in Him. But you know what? The problem is, abiding and abounding take time in patience, don't they? There is no quick, freeze-dried solution, but that's how we like things, don't we? You know, uh, Amazon Prime with free two-day shipping, and uh, we like to have fast food, get through the drive through as quick as we can so we can get to our next place. And uh, if your internet on your phone takes more than 10 seconds to load a web page, you throw it out the window and you go buy a new one, right? We just, we like things quick in America today. That's just our, our heart. We like quick solutions to our problems. And really, isn't that why the lottery exists, Right? <laughs> Isn't that why the lottery exists? We think that if I could just have this pile of cash, all my problems would go away. It would be a quick, freeze-dried solution. Don't want to work for it. Don't want to put in the energy to get to it. Let me put my $5 on the table. And now I can solve all my problems right now. That's the mindset of our culture today. That's the way that we do things. And by the way, this is not a new thing. This is not just an American thing. This is a people thing. 
Yesterday was St. Patrick's Day, and it's kind of a time when we think about Irish things and Irish heritage. How many of you have an Irish heritage? You got Irish in your background somewhere. Only this side of the room, okay. Uh, is this the, the, you know, the Irish versus the English? Is that what's going on over here today? But um, I, I've got a little bit of Irish in my background. You know, I'm kind of a Heinz 57 guy. I've got a little bit of everybody uh, in my background. So, you know, when people say, uh, say certain things, uh, my, my brother, um, I'll tell you this story. Just, uh, we're, we're all friends, right? So uh, my brother, when he was in school, a uh, teacher asked him, uh, what's, your, what's your heritage? What's your lineage? What's your background? Uh, are you English? Are you German? Are you Irish, Scotch, anything like that? And he said, oh, I'm just trailer trash. <laughs> uh, well, thanks, thanks, Justin. I appreciate you putting us in that bucket. But, uh, we're, uh, but anyways, I don't know why I said that. Anyways, but the Irish had an old legend, an old get-rich-quick scheme, didn't they? It was called the leprechaun, right? If you found the leprechaun, you could capture him and he'd tell you where his gold, pot of gold was uh, and how to get to the end of the rainbow and you could become rich by catching a leprechaun. By the way, that takes about the same amount of imagination as it takes to think you're going to win the lottery. Uh, but uh, that's, uh, that we've always had this thing within us of I want a quick solution to my problems. I don't want to put in the work, don't want to put in the energy. You see, even as Christians, many times we see our Christian lives as more of a grocery store. Right? We want to go into the produce department and buy what we need and just have it right there. Have the apples right in front of us. Have the grapes right in front of us. Have the oranges right in front of us. We want to go into the produce department and get it rather than go produce it ourselves. Right? But the problem is, is life is not a grocery store. Life is a harvest field. Life takes planting, watering, time, energy, and it takes diligence to become everything that God wants you to become. The, the Bible teaches us that every person who names the name of Jesus Christ, every person who is a true believer in Jesus Christ, will produce fruit of some kind. You will produce fruit to some degree in your life. Now, some will produce more than others. Some will produce different fruit than others. Some have gifting that causes them to produce different kinds of fruit. But every believer... Every true follower and disciple of Jesus Christ bears the fruit of God's working in your life to some degree. But the thing is, is we don't all have much fruit. Jesus says here, God is glorified when we bear much fruit. And we don't all have much fruit, and we all need to have more fruit, don't we? So that's what we're talking about today, this idea of bearing fruit. So let's discuss this here for just a, a minute. Jesus says, first of all, that this is important for us to bear fruit. Why? Because it glorifies God. It glorifies God. And the, the heart cry of every believer ought to be that God would be glorified. Paul said, I want Christ to be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by even death itself. The, the cry of every believer should be, God, get some glory from me. Lord, use my life however you see fit to get glory for yourself, to get credit and honor on your account, not my account, not so that people can look at me and say what a wonderful Christian he is and what a wonderful person he is, but so that people would look to God in heaven and say, look at what God has done in his life. Look at what God has done. Jesus says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Not glorify me, not glorify your church, not glorify your pastor, not glorify your spiritual mentors, but to turn the credit to God and say, it had to be God. It had to be God that's working in that person's life. The glory of God is at stake here. The glory of God. So let's talk about that here for just a minute. Jesus tells us that fruitfulness brings glory to God. Why would fruitfulness glorify God? Well, think, think about just three things with me about this idea of the glory of God. I think, first of all, fruit, spiritual fruit in our lives, shows the superiority of God's Word over all other philosophies. Spiritual fruit shows the superiority of God's Word over all other philosophies. 
People need to look into our lives as believers and say, why is their life working, but my life isn't? Why are they seeing wonderful things happen, but that's not happening for me? That get-rich-quick scheme or that philosophy that I'm following, that's not panning out. And I'm fighting and I'm upset and my life just isn't going the way I want. But when I look at Christians, when I look at believers, I see something different. I see a success, spiritually speaking. I see a joy from their lives that they might not see in theirs. You know, people very rarely come to Jesus because we outsmart them. People very rarely give their life to Jesus Christ because our theology works better. We can explain our theology better than they can explain their philosophy and their theology. Many people come to Christ when they see you living out your beliefs. And it works. They see you living out the truth of God's Word in your life and they see that it works. They see that there's production there. Christian, you are the example for God. You and I are to be walking, talking representatives of Jesus Christ. The Bible calls us ambassadors. Ambassadors for Christ. And when we produce fruit for God, we produce spiritual blessings in the name of God, people look at us and say, there's something about the way they live that just works. You know, Christianity works if you work it. If you put it to work, it works. But it takes diligence, it takes patience, it takes time to really get it to work, doesn't it? That's the part we don't like. That's the part we don't want to do. We don't want to put the hours in. We don't want to put the time in. We don't want to put the fear in. Because not only does the Christian life require diligence, it requires faith. It requires faith. Because when God tells you to love your enemies, that's not easy to do, is it? But you find out when you love your enemies that God takes over. God moves into the situation. He deals with your enemy. He deals with the situation better than you could. God's Word works if we put it to work. And by the way, can I just encourage you, believer here today, if God's Word isn't producing fruit in your life, if you're not working your Christian life, the Bible says work out your salvation. It doesn't say work for your salvation. It says work out your salvation. And the idea there is that salvation that's inside of you, get what's on the inside on the outside. Put that thing to work so that people can see God in your life so they can see Christ working in you and through you. Remember we talked about that a few weeks ago that the Christian life is not me trying to do all this stuff. It's Jesus living His life through me. It's Christ manifesting Himself through my life. So if you're not producing fruit in your life but you're telling everybody about all of these non-Christian things, all these non-Christian messages, all of these anti-Bible things that you say are working in your life, can I tell you this? That's something uh, that you're sending mixed messages. You're hurting the glory of God. When Christians say, you know what, I'm not worried about what the Bible says, I'm not, just not going to do that, I'm going to try all this stuff over here, but then they say, but I'm a believer, I'm a follower of Christ, you're sending mixed messages. Who are you really following? Are you following Christ or Dr. Phil? Are you following Christ? Or are you following politics? Are you following Christ or are you following CNN? Who are you following? Don't send mixed messages. It confuses people. And it confounds the gospel when we do that. Because, I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't want people to look at my life and say, boy, he's figured, he's figured it all out. He's got it all figured out. By the way, I don't have it all figured out if you haven't noticed. Well, he's got it all figured out. His life is just running, on, running smoothly. I would much rather people look at my life and see the difficulty that uh, we have experienced as a married couple and through cancer and, and infertility and all those things that we've told you about and all those difficulties in our lives. I would much rather people look at that and say, wow, look at what God has done even in their times of confusion. I would much rather have a life that points people to God, even though it might be difficult, even though it might be confusing at times. I would much rather have that than to have easy street and just live on the gravy train. Let there be no greater credit given 
than the credit that we give to God and to his word. The spiritual fruit, it shows the superiority of God's word, but it also shows the power of the gospel. It shows the power of the gospel. Go over to Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 for just a minute. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. The Apostle Paul tells us here in Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. When you and I produce spiritual fruit, it shows people the power of the gospel, the gospel's moving, working energy. The word for gospel here in verse number 16 in the Greek is evangelion. It means good news. Good news. We live in a world today where we're saturated with news, but most of it is bad news, isn't it? It's the, the vast majority of what we hear is negative. It's trying to get us fired up. It's trying to get us riled up. Why? Because when we do that, we'll sit and we'll watch the program longer, won't we? We'll watch Tucker uh, fight some guy or we'll watch uh, Chris Cuomo beat some guy over the head or whatever or Don Lemon, all these guys. We'll just watch them just go back and forth with each other because there's something within our fallen nature that just loves that. Just get riled up and, and we get that, that fight within us. We don't need more bad news as much as we need a little bit of good news. And the best news of all is that Jesus Christ came into this world, the Son of God, God Himself, in the flesh, came to live with us, came to be like us. He howled around and was friends with the lowest of society that nobody else wanted to be around. Jesus said, I'm coming for them. And Jesus came and he died for their sins. And can I say this? He died for your sins too when he died on that cross. And he extends forgiveness to the entire human race. Anyone that wants to believe in Jesus Christ, anyone that comes to him by faith, he will save. It's the greatest news of all, isn't it? That doesn't get better than that news. The word here for gospel here is evangelion, but the word here for power is equally interesting. Verse 16 there, he says, it is the power of God. The word here for power is, in the Greek, it's dunamis. Dunamis. The word dunamis, uh, it, it refers to moral power and excellence of the soul. But it goes deeper than that. It's a word that, that talks about explosive power, energetic power. The, it talks, uh, in, in the New Testament, when we see it used, it refers to miracles and marvelous works that God has done. These are powerful, explosive moments where God breaks on the scene and does something that's incredible. We actually get our word dynamite and dynamic from the word dunamis. It comes from that Greek root. So the gospel of Jesus Christ is not only good news, it is explosively powerful. It changes things. The thing about dynamite is once you light the fuse, everything's about to change, right? Once you light the fuse on that stick of dynamite, everything in the near vicinity, everything within the reach of that explosion is going to change. And it's going to change in a big, big way. And that's kind of what Paul's talking about here in verse 16. He says, this is God's explosive power to change things. A lot of people in our world today, unbelievers are stuck in a rut. They're stuck. They're mired down. They don't know how to change the vicious cycles that they go through. Some people are struggling through the, the cycles of addiction. Others are going through the cycles of abuse and things like that all around us. But most of the world is stuck in our own vicious routine, right? We get mired down in our own routine thinking that that's sufficient. What we need is an infusion of the good news. This world needs somebody to light the fuse of the gospel and explode on the scene and make a change. And when you produce good fruit, you are demonstrating the explosive power that the gospel has had in your life. 
you were showing to people that God has made a change. He's made a change. I've told you the story before about a couple years ago, Heather and I were on vacation and we visited a church and we were just talking with some of the people there. And there was this elderly gentleman who was sitting in the back and he was just... Uh, he, he was all, for, for lack of a better term, not to be disrespectful, but he was just stove up. He was frozen. He couldn't move very well. He, he, it took him a long time to walk. When he walked, he shuffled. His knees didn't bend very well. His back looked like it was just broken in two. He was all hunched over. And we went and we talked with him. And he told us the story of his life. He'd been, a, I think it was a race car driver, a, a sprint car driver on dirt tracks uh, for a long time. And he'd gotten into all kinds of accidents. And one day, he got into a terrible accident that broke most of his body. And he, we, you know, when somebody says that, you just kind of pause and say, I want to hear the end of this story, right? And as he continued the story, he said it was there in that hospital, as he was broken, that God woke him up to his need. He realized that what he was doing was destroying himself. The way he was living, the routines he was in was just causing nothing but wreck after wreck after wreck. You ever feel that way? I mean, in a spiritual sense? You ever feel that way in your own life that you just go from problem to problem to problem that you've created wreck after wreck after wreck? That's what he was experiencing. And he said, it was there in that hospital that I came to Jesus Christ. He said, I got saved. And he said, God just revolutionized me. And he said, I still have to carry the brokenness in my body, but Jesus saved my soul. And I looked at him and I said, man, Jesus has made a huge change in your life, hasn't he? He said, no, that Jesus is the change in my life. I tell you, friends, that is what we need, the explosion of God's working in our lives. And when you produce spiritual fruit, you are showing the explosive nature of the gospel. The gospel is at the root of all of this. The good news of Jesus Christ makes for great living. It really does. It doesn't erase your problems. If you think that when you trust Jesus Christ, all of a sudden all your problems are going to go away, all your bills are going to get magically paid, can I tell you this? Probably every Christian in this room can tell you that's just not going to happen. It doesn't make all your problems go away, but you know what? It helps you not create more problems. And it helps you deal with the current problems that you have to face. It shows you a different way of living. Third, it not only does this uh, fruitfulness show the superiority of God's Word, and not only does it show the power of the Gospel, it also shows how excellent God's character is. It shows how excellent God's character is. Romans chapter 8 tells us that every believer is predestined to become like Jesus. God does all kinds of things in our lives to make us more like Jesus, to conform us to the image of His Son. And when that new fruit, that that, that good fruit is produced out of our lives, when God bursts that fruit within us and outside of us, it shows that what we are becoming in Jesus is a beautiful and a powerful thing. As you become more conformed to Christ's character and you produce the fruit of godliness and righteousness in your life, it shows just how wonderful God really is. Any good thing in my life as a Christian doesn't demonstrate how great of a person I am. It shows how wonderful of a God I serve. Any good thing that's being produced out of your life doesn't show how hard you're working or how diligently you're working as much as it shows that you serve an awesome God. And His character is incredible. His way of thinking, His way of doing things is incredible. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, this is the Apostle Paul again. He says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So what he says here is it's like somebody who goes into the bathroom and they're looking in the mirror. It's not fogged up from the steam from the shower. It's a clear glass. 
They can see perfectly. And as we look into the Bible, as we look into the story of Jesus and His life, as we look through Scripture, we are seeing the image of God. We're seeing the character of Christ. It's like somebody looking into a mirror, but they don't see themselves. They see Jesus on the other side of that mirror. And as we look into that image, as we look upon the face of Jesus Christ in the Word of God, it says that we are changed. When I go to, into the bathroom and I, and I cut the lights on and I look in the mirror and I do my hair and I brush my teeth and I trim my beard and all those things, I'm doing the work, right? I'm doing the energy based on what I see in the mirror. But he's saying here that the Bible, as we look into the image of Jesus in the Word of God, God does the work. He does the trimming. He does the cleaning. He does the combing. He changes us from glory to glory. From glory to glory. He's saying here that God just layers upon layer. He takes one layer of good work, He puts that into our life, and then He takes another layer and He lays it on top, and He just builds this beautiful picture out of our lives. Ladies, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you go in the bathroom or to your vanity every day and sit in front of that mirror and put that stuff all over your face. Just don't know how you do it. I couldn't do it. It just, I couldn't do it. But you know a little bit of what we're talking about here, right? You understand the, the picture a little bit, right? Because when a, a lady puts on makeup, many times she'll put on several different pieces, right? She'll put on the primer, and then she puts on the, the top coat, the finished coat, and then she puts a little clear coat on top of it to make it real durable. Is that not how it works? It doesn't work that way, huh? That, well, is that what, I, I think it's called foundation, right? Put a little foundation on there, and then you put that powder stuff on there, and then you put a little bit of highlights on and all that good stuff, and then you're ready for the day. That's kind of what God's talking about. He says that He beautifies our lives by placing layer upon layer from glory to glory. What is that glory that he's talking about? It's the glory that we point back to God. We are glorifying God and pointing people to the beauty of God. The more you focus your life to be like Christ, the more fruitful you will become. The more you focus your life on you, the less fruitful you become. So lose yourself in who Jesus is. Lose yourself in the glory of Jesus Christ. You know, I, I hate to break it to you, but it's not all about you. And it's not all about me. In fact, it never was about you. It never was about me. Lose yourself in the glory of Jesus Christ. You might ask at this point, why is it so important to Jesus that His followers would bring glory to God? Why does that matter? Uh, why is that a big deal? Can I just encourage you with this thought? If you have to ask that question, remind yourself of how good God has been to you. Remind yourself of the freedom from sin that there is in Jesus. Remind yourself of the salvation, the forgiveness of sins that Jesus extends to us and live in that Christ-focused relationship. So we talked about the glory of God. Let's talk here for just a minute about the fruit of the believer. The fruit of the believer. We need to get the foundation right, that we are to glorify God. Okay, well now how are we supposed to glorify God? Jesus tells us that we do it by producing fruit. So let's look at some examples of the fruit of the, belie uh, uh, the, fruit of the believer. First of all, go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Should just be a couple page turns for you there. The Apostle Paul says here, But the fruit of the Spirit, there's that word, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So he says here that the first fruit is the fruit of the Spirit, or spiritual attitudes, God-glorifying attitudes. Notice that all of these things are attitudes of the heart that then display themselves in our lives. So he says here these are spiritual attitudes that need to be evident uh, in our lives. And we're going to look at these fruit a little bit later in the year, 
We're going to kind of cut through these uh, a little bit later and see what's inside of them, Lord willing. So we won't spend a lot of time uh, on each fruit themselves. But I want you to look at the verse that comes, or the verses that come before the fruit are mentioned. All right, back up just a little bit to verse number 19. Verse number 19. We've seen the fruit, but look at the contrast of the fruit. What is the opposite of the fruit of the Spirit. Verse number 19, now the works of the flesh. Huh. Fruit of the Spirit, works of the flesh. We're dealing with opposite ideas here, aren't we? He says, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. So the fruit of the Spirit stand in opposition or in contrast. They're the opposite side of the coin from the works of the flesh. These works and these fruit could not be more opposite from one another. But notice the way he phrases this here. There's the fruit of the Spirit and there's the works of the flesh. Works are deeds. They're actions. They're things you do. Fruit... Uh, are just are things that are naturally produced, right? A tree doesn't stand uh, under doesn't stand under the sun and say, "I need to produce more fruit." Let me grip my teeth and flex, and I can produce more fruit. And pop, out comes more fruit, right? It doesn't work that way. Fruit are naturally produced if the conditions are right. If the tree is healthy, it will produce fruit. Works is something that you do. It's behavior. It's actions. Fruit are attitudes of the heart. They show up in our deeds, but they begin in the heart of the Christian. By the way, can I just say this? You can do the right thing and have a sorry attitude about it. My wife sometimes will remind me that the trash needs to be taken out. And if it's a, if it's a bad day, i got a lot going on, I don't always have the best attitude about that. You know, I'm busy doing other things. I'm not going to, I don't want to deal with this right now. And you go in and you, you open it up and you make a bunch of noises. You rustle it and you go out and you open up the trash can and you slam the trash down and you slam the lid. And rah, 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 rah. I did what I was supposed to do. But did I really do what I was supposed to do? Not really. Good, thank you for answering glad somebody's tracking here this morning. You can do the right thing but have a sorry attitude about it. But it is impossible to have the right attitude and not have right behavior accompany it. Did you get that? It is impossible to have the right attitude and not have good fruit being birthed out of that. Let me give you an example. I can do something that people think is loving but it's really selfish. It's motivated by my desire for credit, my desire for glory, for somebody to pat me on the back and tell me what a good boy I am. I can do something that appears loving, but it's really selfish. But I can't truly love someone without showing behavior that demonstrates that love towards them. That's what he's talking about here. Go back to verse 17. Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, then we'll move on to the next fruit. He says, the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that ye would. A believer can produce the fruit of the spirit, or he can do the works of the flesh. You can do either or. You can produce one or the other. So how do you produce one, but not the other? Well, go back one more verse, verse 16. Paul says, this I say then... Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you live as God has designed life to be lived, if you know Him, love Him, obey His Word, you will produce more fruit than you do the works of the flesh. If you don't want to live as a slave to your desires, then let Jesus express Himself. Through you. Do the things we just mentioned. Know Him, love Him, obey Him, follow Him. So, the first fruit we see of the believer is the fruit of the Spirit. I want you to notice here briefly 
a resentment of the reality of sin. A resentment of the reality of sin. Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, Jesus said, or I'm sorry, John the, uh, John the Baptist said, Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. Meet for repentance. He says there is a fruit that demonstrates a resentment of sin within us. This is not sorrow over the consequences of sin. Everybody's sorry when they get caught. Everybody's sorry when it's brought out into the light of day. This is not sorrow over the consequences of sin. This is sorrow over the reality of sin within us. Not sorry that I did it. It's sorry that it even exists within me, a desire to do this. A repentance not just of bad behavior, but of bad, attitude, it's bad attitudes themselves. Christians ought to hate the fact that we live with a spiritual handicap called the sin nature. And every day, you and I fight it. We wrestle against it. And you know what? We ought to resent it. It ticks me off sometimes that I act the way that I act. It makes me angry sometimes that I do the things that I do or I think the things that I think or I talk to people the way that I talk to people. There is this crippling handicap called the sin nature that we have to struggle with every day. This past week, Stephen Hawking passed away, one of the greatest uh, minds of our generation. He passed away from ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease, as it was once called. ALS is a terrible disease. It is a horrible, uh, handicapping disease. Because the mind of the person that has ALS, their mind is working perfectly. Their mind is humming along, it's working just as well as it ever did, but their body becomes frozen. Their body becomes, for lack of a better term, it becomes crippled. It becomes broken and unusable. And so the mind of the person, which is working well, which wants to express itself, it is trapped inside of this broken frame. It's a terrible, terrible disease for anyone to have. But you know what? That picture of ALS is a little bit of a sample. It's a little bit of, it gives us a little bit of an idea of what it's like to be a Christian. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Every believer ought to have something within them that wants to be more for Jesus Christ, that wants to know Him better, that wants to know His Word better, that wants to glorify Him more. But there ought to be a resentment, resentment from within as well over this brokenness that we all face. Godly sorrow works repentance. Another fruit that the Bible talks about is the fruit of worship. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 15 says, The fruit of our lips giving thanks to His name. The fruit of our lips giving thanks to His name. The fruit of worship. You can sing songs about Jesus without knowing Him. But you can't offer a sacrifice of praise if you don't know Him. It requires it to be personal. It requires it to come from the heart of the person. There is a difference between an intellectual knowledge, a head knowledge of Christ, and a heart knowledge of Jesus Christ. You can sing songs about Him without knowing Him, but you can't sing songs to Him unless you know Him. And then there's the fruit of giving. The fruit of giving. Philippians chapter 4, verse 17, the Apostle Paul says, I desire fruit that may abound to your account. It, when you are a generous person with others, when you give to the work of the Lord, when you give to those who are in need, when you give to those you love, when you give to those who are your enemies, you are bearing fruit. You're bearing spiritual fruit. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 14 uh, the Apostle Paul talks about in the churches of that era, there were miraculous things going on. People were understanding things that they shouldn't have known. They called it a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom. They'd be able to look into somebody's life and say, you're struggling with this hidden sin. And Paul said that in that day when tongues were being spoken, when the word of knowledge was going on, he says, you can have that understanding, you can have that spiritual work going on, but that understanding is unfruitful unless I'm doing it in the Holy Spirit. If it's being energized by God, if it's God driving me to bring this up, if it's God seasoning my speech with grace, then it's going to be communication that blesses. 
communication that blesses. Make it your goal sometime this week or every day of this week to put a smile on somebody's face, to say something to them that will bless them. Leave that building, leave that place, leave that home a little better than you found it. Give some communication that blesses. And then he talks about godly behavior. Godly behavior. Colossians chapter 1 verse 10 and Philippians 1 verse 11 says we ought to be fruitful in every good work. Fruitful in every good work. Godly behavior is a spiritual fruit. It is something that Jesus bursts from within us to the outside of us. And then in John chapter 4, we see the final fruit we're going to talk about here today, the fruit of souls. The fruit of souls. Jesus talks there about gathering fruit unto life eternal. Gathering fruit unto life eternal. Proverbs chapter 11 verse 30 says, He that winneth souls is wise. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Wise people will win souls. Wise people will win souls. If you are wise, you will be like a productive fruit-bearing tree that people will see as a source of help and a source of encouragement. And when they need some sweetness in their life, when they need some nourishing fruit in their life, they will come to you because they know there's some wisdom in that person. They can help me. And you have the opportunity to win souls, not just to yourself, but to win them to Christ Himself. To win them to the Lord. Be a person concerned with souls. Be a person concerned with souls. Jesus is concerned about souls. Jesus, that's his driving force, is the souls of men. So if you want to become more like Jesus, start by being concerned about other people's souls and what's going to happen to them when they leave this earth. What's going to happen to them when they die. There was once an old man who was planting seeds for pecan trees. And pecan trees take several years to grow and become strong enough where they begin to produce pecans. By the way, how do you say it in Missouri? Is it pecans, 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 okay, pecans. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm gonna, it's a hard habit to break. The, the, these pecans were hard to grow. They take time. And so this elderly man in his last couple of years of life was out here planting these things. A young man comes up to him and says, what are you doing? You're never going to get to see the fruit of that. You're never going to get to eat a pecan off of any of those trees. You're wasting your time. And the elderly man looked at the young man and said, boy, I've been eating pecans my whole life off of trees that I never planted. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I'm going to pay it forward. Somebody loved you enough, Christian, to talk to you about Jesus Christ, to win your soul to Christ. Pay it forward. Pay it forward. Be a blessing to somebody else. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 gives us a criteria. We'll close with this. A criteria. Is this every spiritual fruit? Is this every good fruit? No, it's not. This is not an exhaustive list. I hope it's been a help, but it's not everything. So how do we know if it's a spiritual fruit? Well, Philippians 4 verse 8 gives us the criteria. He says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. God wants us to produce things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report. So he commands us, dwell on these things. Think on these things. Don't fill your mind up with junk. Fill your mind up with things that are nourishing to your soul. Everything that you do that is done in agreement with God's heart and God's will is a fruit. It is a spiritual fruit. And the command is to bear much of it. To bear much of it. So should we wring our hands if we aren't rapidly producing fruit yet? Should we uh, wring our hands if we've tapered off from where we once were? We need to take heart because God knows how to get you there. And He knows how to get you back there. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you will grow and produce more fruit as you follow Him. Let me close with this story and we'll be done here this morning. But this, this reminds me of a story from medieval times. There was a king who passed away suddenly. And having no heir, having no descendant, 
the, 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 the kingdom was worried, who are we going to have as our next king? So all of the young noblemen from the kingdom were called to the castle. And as they came to the castle, they gathered around the moat around the castle, this big body of water that protected uh, the castle wall. The young men were told that whoever, whoever would swim across the moat first would be crowned king. So whoever got from this side to this side first would be crowned king. The only problem was that to cross the moat, the men would have to jump off a 100-foot sheer cliff into the moat, which was filled with deadly piranhas, and swim across the 100-yard body of water. And, by the way, it was December, so the water was freezing. When the starting trumpet was blown, no one moved. It was still and quiet until one person was seen falling into the water. He swam quickly across the moat, came to the other side, and fell onto the ground exhausted. The attendants came to him and wrapped him in a blanket and and got him dry. And as he's there shivering from being in the water, one of these attendants looked at him and said, You're the new king. Congratulations. What is going to be your first order as king? And he said, To find and to hang the guy that pushed me off that cliff. Can I encourage you with this? Don't despise the pushing of God. Don't despise the nudges, the bumps, the pushes of God in your life. Because if you will allow Him to do it, you will produce fruit that you never dreamed possible. You will see things come out of your life that that wasn't there five years ago. That wasn't there ten years ago. That heart of compassion, that heart of love, that heart of kindness, that heart of generosity, it wasn't there. You will produce fruit that you never dreamed possible if you do it in Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the wisdom that we find from Scripture. God, this is the truth. And I pray that you would help us to see it so and to put it into practice in our lives. Lord, I pray that you'd bless us now in this time of invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed here today, if you're here and you would say, Pastor Brian, I know that I'm saved, I know I'm on my way to heaven, and I can tell you why from the Bible. If that's you this morning, you know that you're born again, would you just slip your hand up there as a testimony of praise to God? Amen. Thank you. You can put your hands down there. If you were unable to raise your hand, can I tell you this? God wants you to know. God has put it within His Word so that we can know. We'd love to help you with that today. We'd love to take the Word of God and show you today how to become a believer in Jesus Christ. Come forward during the invitation and someone will take the Word of God and show you how to be born again. Maybe you're here today and you say, Preacher, I know I'm saved. I know I'm on my way to heaven. But God's spoken to me today. God's dealt with my heart. And I want to respond to God's working in my heart. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up there? I just want to pray for you. We're not going to call you out. not going to call you down. But if God has spoken to you, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Our ensemble is going to come and they're going to lead us in uh, a song that's becoming more familiar to us. Be unto your name. And as they lead us into this song, if God has spoken in your heart, I invite you to come to the altar. I invite you to come down and do business with God. So, so whether you're there in your seat, or whether you're down here at this altar, if God has spoken to you, would you stand with us and just sing along? Be unto your name. If God has spoken to you, would you come down?
Piper and Hadley, and thankful for the family that's uh, here today to experience this as well. And uh, look, we've got some uh, guests with us from each family. Michelle, can you tell us all of your family? Um, I have my, my mother, Lynn, my stepmother, Brenda, and my father, Larry. Right. And then, of course, our good finger side is always here. <laughs> <laughs> well, glad to have you all here today. And uh, Donna, uh, tell us about who's here with you. My dad, Donald, we have Doyle, and well, so, so this, this story is, is pretty incredible, I think. It's just a, it's a neat story, and it shows us that you as parents, if you're diligent, if you're training your children up in the things of the Lord, training them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, uh, God gives you some pretty neat things. Hadley, I guess, was very interested in some spiritual things and in, in salvation for a while, and Donna and Chris were working with her through that and explaining it to her, and then eventually one day she said, we're ready. I'm ready to do this, and then she trusted Christ that day on the way to school, right? And then at school, uh, of course, she wanted to tell people about it. That's one of the great things about new Christians. They want to tell people that they know the Lord. And so she told Piper about it. And then Piper was more ready than I think anybody realized. She was ready to go as well. And so we had to have the opportunity to bring her friend uh, to the Lord, and Piper got to say it that day. And now they want everybody to know about it, and they want to express this uh, through the ordinance that Jesus gave us of baptism. And if we don't believe that baptism is going to do anything to bring these girls salvation, that baptism is just a demonstration, it's a picture, a symbol, uh, that we are uh, alive without Christ, and then when we're plunged into his death, uh, we come out new creatures. It's just an expression, it's just a picture of that salvation that's already taking place. And so we're so thankful to enjoy this when they're here. Piper's going to come on in first. Piper, come on down. Well, thank you, Pastor Mark. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Thank you, Pastor Mark. I'm on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior. I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We bury you with Christ in baptism. We raise the walk in this life.